You have the determination to make things happen, the will to lead, and the skills to start, run, and grow your own business. Bank of America believes that's only the beginning of what you can accomplish. As part of its ongoing commitment to women small business owners, local specialists will work one-on-one with you to meet the needs of your business. You get the advice, guidance, and resources that can help you navigate challenges today and prepare for what's ahead. To learn more about how you can grow your business with confidence, visit bankofamerica.com slash sbwomen. Bank of America. What would you like the power to do? Hey, Eagles fans, this is Mike Kay from NJ Advanced Media, and welcome to the No Huddle Show podcast, where we discuss anything and everything Philadelphia Eagles. You can read our content on nj.com slash Eagles, bookmark that, and you can subscribe to our exclusive Eagles Insider Tech Service, where we'll break news, give you insider observations, and provide in-depth analysis. Through Eagles Extra, you can send questions and comments directly to us, and we'll respond to your phone. With me today, as always, is my fellow Eagles beat reporter, Chris Franklin. Tonight... Well, because we're recording this after the game, so no need to say today. We're going to discuss the Eagles' 42-30 to loss to the Chiefs, Jalen Hurts' performance in that game, and then reasons for optimism, question mark? Before we get into that, though, let's see how Chris is doing. Chris, how are you? I don't know how to feel. I truly am. I I feel like I'm torn. Like I feel like I kind of want to rip the team, but I saw a lot of things that were... That, that that showed that there's some bright spots ahead if that if, if that makes sense oh, totally. that man yeah how about you how are you feeling uh I mean look I think I look so I got a lot of heat for being super optimistic about this team I really bought into Sirianni uh from the jump uh because I had covered coaches like him in the past and I also had covered coaches that were like ant- that antithetical to him as well um I liked his staff, but I got to tell you, uh, not looking great these last three weeks. Uh, <laughs> and it's not even a talent thing. It's like a self-inflicted wound thing. You're seeing bad, bad penalties. You're seeing repeated mistakes. You're seeing play calling issues. Like this isn't a talent. Th- I mean, look, they're, they're not that talented of a team. I'm not trying to like take away from the roster building angle because I know a lot of fans are frustrated with the talent at linebacker and the talent at corner and the talent at safety and the talent at wide receiver, et cetera. Look, this is not a good, talented depth chart. I thought they'd be middling. Uh, They are making me look bad for saying that. But (laughs) um, look, I think Howie Roseman should be feeling a little warm right now. Uh, I think Nick Sirianni, by association, should feel pretty warm right now. This team does not look well coached. it, like, it's weird. Like, week one was like a mirage, right? It seemed like week one was the exception and not the rule. And look, I wrote this last week. This is a four-game stretch where we're going to learn a lot about Nick Sirianni, his coaching staff, and his roster. I feel like we learned a lot about them today and not a lot of great things. I mean, there's stuff to take away that we'll get into later uh, from an optimistic standpoint, but I think from like a negative standpoint, these penalties don't seem like they're going a- away anytime soon. His use of veteran players, it just seems like a lot of veterans on this team are just here. Um, I'm not going to say like, hey, they're just collecting a paycheck because some of them are working really hard. They're just not being productive. And, you know, I thought the Eagles had an easy out at the end of the Doug Peterson era. They could have come out and like transparency transparently like embraced a rebuild like hey look this team's gonna grow with this fan base this young fan base we're gonna see you know how they can can evolve with this young coach and this young staff and all this stuff instead they use the word transition period which makes it kind of sound like you have one foot in the rebuild pile and another foot in the tracking the nfc east competition for the division so i i after this game, it really feels like that's like the embodiment of where they were this offseason. Like they competed for three quarters, and then in the fourth quarter, it showed how much more talented and how much better coached the Chiefs were than the Eagles. Are you feeling what I'm saying? 
Well, I thought they should have just gone out to. A, I agree with you. I thought they should have just flat out gone into a full fledged rebuild. I, I mean, they had the assets. They, they had a lot of young guys in positions that were going to be critical, starting with the quarterback, playing at wide receiver. They had a lot of guys that were on his team that they were going to have to rely on. So they just should have just said, not put all this pressure on them and just gone, hey, you know what? We're going to let these guys figure their way out. We have a young coach. We're, we're excited about what we could potentially build. Let's go from here. But instead, it looks like they got caught up on, oh, you know what? Maybe we should go ahead and, ch- and chase it. I don't know if it was something where they felt like they had to get more merchandise sales or what what have you. But when you look at signings like Ryan Kerrigan, when you look at some of these other guys that were added on there, the Eric Wilsons and, so, and other stuff, like they are like they were trying to build right now and thinking, oh, we can quickly get this turned around. Yeah, it's the NFL. Everybody else gets things turned around quickly. And that's not the case with this team. And even, and even if you look compare them to other teams in this division – Save for the Giants, I don't think they really compete that well. And this division is not going to have two teams that come out of there for a wild card spot. So it didn't make sense to try to push for that anyway. I thought it should have been more about making sure these players get right for the future. And I put I've I put the way this team's built, it's, it, you can't, there's no way to put it, it's squarely on general manager Howie Roseman and how he went about doing this. And I don't know if he got the edict from Jeffrey Lurie saying it has they have to go for it each and every year. I think that hurts them in the long run because this you have to build a strong foundation. This foundation right now is down, but there's also some cracks to it too. So they have to fight. They they just I I still understand the complete way that they were trying to build this team going into the season. Yeah, and I think you bring up Howie Roseman, and I think it's important because I've been somebody who has defended him. As a in a rational way, like I, I believe me, there are clear issues here with this roster building. But I do wonder if, it, they, as you brought up, there's like this large looming cloud of Jeffrey Lurie who just constantly wants a winner, and so you're constantly kicking the can down the road. Um, I'm not trying to pass off blame on the owner. Look, Harry Roseman, um, based on the first month of the season, has done a horrible job. Uh, based on the first month of the season. If we're looking at just this season right now, and I look, I, I, people are fair to criticize what he's done the last two years. Definitely has earned that criticism. Um, but right now, this seems to be like an all-encompassing failure. I, I, I mean, like for real, Nick Sirianni deserves a lot of blame for the, the failures so far. Jonathan Gannon's been outcoached like exponentially over the past two weeks uh, after we kind of built him up uh, pretty heavily. Like I I'm kind of like thrown off and not to like toot my own horn, but I I'm rarely like completely surprised or off by what happens. Right. Like that's not, I typically feel like I have a good feel of that because I've been around some really bad teams with the Jaguars. I don't think this is a really bad team. I still think this is a middling team. I still think they win six to seven to eight games because of the second half of their schedule. Do I think they're going to make the playoffs? Absolutely not. Do I think uh, Howie Roseman's going to come out of this smelling like roses? Absolutely not. Do I think Nick Sirianni can turn this around, this narrative around him around? Absolutely. Um, And so having said that, let's talk about the most positive performance of this game before we kind of get into the negative, I, w- I want to talk, or more of the negative, I want to talk about Jalen Hurts because Nick Sirianni, whether he was like just being hyperbolic or what, said that, that today's performance by Jalen Hurts was one of the best quarterback performances he's ever seen. He said that this was the best that he's seen him seen it, seen of him in a game or in practice, and I agree. I thought he played extremely efficient. Football. I thought he did a lot of really g- good, great things at times. Uh, he had a bit of bad luck with penalty issues. There were some miscues here and there. But for the most part, I thought Jalen Hurts bounced back in a tremendous way from the Dallas loss. What was your take on his performance? Well, see, this is where I want to go the opposite of what you say, where everything is whole and thing was an all encompassing failure, because I think you're allowing Jalen Hurts to grow. And I think we're seeing that right before our eyes. I thought he played 
frankly, his best game of the season. And I think for his best game of his career. And that's just not numbers wise. I just look at what he did. Now, a lot of the stuff was formationally done and schemed up by using a lot of the underneath routes and giving and creating space for Dallas Goddard and, and, and Devonta Smith and a lot of these other receivers to play within the middle of the field and take advantage of the Chiefs defense. But I thought he just let the game came to him, took what the de- took what the defense gave him. He allowed to he allowed to do that, and then he ran when he had to. I mean, and think about this: he did this all behind a makeshift offensive line. I mean, you found out before the game that Lane Johnson was not going to be available because of the personal matters. You didn't. The only person you had remaining from that Week One starting line was Jason Kelsey, and he goes in and throws three hundred eighty-seven yards and had four hundred over four hundred yards in total offense as a whole. More and more, I, I look at him. I know I've used Russell Wilson in the past, but I see a little Kyler Murray in him too, and they're and they're pretty much since like only a couple of years are removed from each other from from the draft. But I look at Kyler Murray, I look at him, and I see this, this is what this offense can become, and you have to continue to build around him. He's making some good decisions, though. And I say that with the caveat of I wish he would throw the ball away or not throw the ball away because that's the reason I'm bringing this up. I wish he would run the ball more when his RPOs take a little bit longer to develop because. Some of those penalties for an ineligible man downfield are based off of the timing, and he's still throwing eye for that. So I don't like that. But I think overall, when you look at what he's doing now, look if you see the growth that he's had over this season far from the beginning of training camp, you look at the growth that he's giving you, and you look at his ball, the ball he's throwing is a lot, looking a little bit more accurate as well too. I think you have something that you could build upon here if they give if the Eagles give her some time. You have the determination to make things happen, the will to lead, and the skills to start, run, and grow your own business. Bank of America believes that's only the beginning of what you can accomplish. As part of its ongoing commitment to women small business owners, local specialists will work one-on-one with you to meet the needs of your business. You get the advice, guidance, and resources that can help you navigate challenges today and prepare for what's ahead. To learn more about how you can grow your business with confidence, visit bankofamerica.com slash sbwomen. Bank of America. What would you like the power to do? I've been impressed by Jalen Hurts, the person and the player this week. And I think that those matching those two elements together is really important for the remainder of the season. Who's to say that he's going to be a great franchise quarterback or if he's even going to be a franchise quarterback, but I do buy into him as a leader. I buy into him as a player um, and I'm interested to see what happens th- throughout the rest of the season because at least that'll be interesting. Um, his connection with Devontae Smith was very apparent in this game. He had a 34-yard touchdown uh, pass uh, down down the left side of the field that was called back because Smith stepped out of bounds, similar to how Jalen Rager did in, in Week 2 against the 49ers. Um, but Smith still had 122 yards on, I believe it was seven catches. Uh, he had an impressive day. Dallas Goddard also had an impressive day, five catches for 56 yards and a touchdown. You brought up the makeshift offensive line. I thought they did a really good job, uh, relative to expectations. Like you said, a couple hours before the game, Lane Johnson, uh, was ruled out due to a personal matter. Um, Jack Driscoll started at right tackle. I thought he did a tremendous job. Uh, Nate Herbig started at right guard. I thought he had one of the better games, at least watching live, that he's had. And then I thought Landon Dickerson looked a lot more comfortable at left guard. So, look, Dillard had two penalties. One of them was a holding. One was that illegal uh, di- uh, lineman downfield, uh, which I kind of put as, as kind of – you know, uh, a shared penalty with Jalen Hurts. Um, I thought the offensive line looked good. So I'm getting all of the positive stuff out of the way for me for right now, because Chris is going to have a whole other segment of optimistic stuff down the road uh, in this podcast. But let's get into the negative stuff, because there was a lot. This game was weird, right? It, it felt like the Eagles shouldn't have had even a shot in this game. Um and yet they were competitive for three quarters. And so I think that was kind of a shock to the system. They lost largely due to self-inflicted wounds, including uh, nine penalties for 49 yards, three wiped out touchdowns via penalties. Although one of those penalties, the JJR single white side uh, pass interference penalty was one of the worst penalties I've seen in a very long time. Um, and, then you had, you know, this defense giving up 471 total yards 
I mean, the Eagles picked up 461, but it was how it happened, right? And so you have the Chiefs running for 200 yards. On top of that, uh, Patrick Mahomes leads six scoring drives, throws for five touchdowns, nearly 300 yards. They couldn't stop this guy. Uh, except for an interception that Josh Sweat forced on a pressure that Eric Wilson uh, caught. Um, this defense is not good, uh, personnel-wise. Fletcher Cox has not been good. Uh, Javon Hargrave has been very good. But everybody else really on the defensive line has kind of been middling. The uh, linebacker group has been horrific. This whole rotation with Eric Wilson and TJ Edwards and Alex Singleton and Davion Taylor is not making up for the lack of talent in this group. Um, I don't care what package you have Eric Wilson in. He's seemingly missing a tackle. Um, I thought the secondary wasn't as bad as, as the numbers kind of indicate, but I don't think they played very well either. Uh, Chris, let's get into the negatives. What stood out to you negatively? Well, I thought, uh, see, for me, it was the main thing. It was that second unit, the second layer of the defense with the linebackers. I mean, if looking at Eric Eric Wilson, I, I was basically feel like there was another 50 that was out there in the field, Mark Simino, just for a simple fact that he kept missing on the tackles. I mean, heading into the game, Wilson, the Eagles had two of the top the two of the top uh missed tackle linebackers in the in the league. You had Alex Singleton who led the league in uh missed tackles coming in the game with six. He had uh Eric Wilson with five. And I know the stats are gonna show you, you when you look at the stats, you go, Eric Wilson, okay, he had ten tackles, quarterback hit and interceptions. Nice. There should have been a lot more, and it should never even came to that part because he sh- his t- tally should have been a lot more. And a lot of times he was getting blown off the ball by the the, the Chiefs guards and, and guards were just get, he was accepting a lot of hits. He he wasn't trying to fight off fight off a lot of his blocks. I don't know what this. I don't know if Gannon has to do what Gannon has to do to get this. Uh, T.J. Edwards deserves more run on his defense. He really does. Even if you got put Sean Bradley or whatever, put him in. Was, just get a more physical middle linebacker in there. And I don't. And, and basically, I know the thing you're going to say is, well, the coverage wise, the first or second downs, that's what dictates him because they throw the ball more. Blah 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 blah. Now nah, Wilson just it, Wilson has the physical traits to be one though, but he's not something about missing. He's not putting it together, so that's bad. I'm not going to put I'm not going to put this too much on the secondary. I know it sounds crazy to do, especially with the day that Tariq Hill had, but the defensive scheme was to make sure that Hill didn't beat you beat, beat you deep. And a lot of that came with that fourth quarter, uh, that last fourth quarter drive that uh, the Chiefs had, which was uh, I kind of thought that uh, like Andy was kind of sort of running running up the score when it came to that deep pass instead of just doing something else. But that's a whole other argument. But I look at that, I thought they held their own and kept Hill in front of them. And that's what, since they did that, the safeties held them in front. That's why I look at that second layer when it comes to when it came to Singleton and Wilson to stopping those crossing routes, and they weren't able to do that. The Chiefs found the Chiefs found the soft spots in between them in the zones and took advantage of that. And for a lot, and, and the other part I want to say as well too, that pass rush it it it, it was it's been non-existent. And I think that's where the strength coming into this season. You look at it was you thought it was going to be the defensive line and getting rushed with the four, and they're just not getting it done. I mean Kerrigan. We, we finally got to see Kerrigan actually show up and make an impact, but it was only because he drew a holding penalty. He's still having issues. Sweat, you know, just got that extension. He went, he jumped off sides twice. One that basically, uh, that, that prolonged a drive and ended up with another Chiefs touchdown. It, you're just seeing so many of these guys. You're not seeing that consistent pass was safe for Jav- Javon Hargrave that getting home. So I just look, I would say the front seven has just been. It's been extremely disappointing to begin this season. Yeah, I think I have four pressure points of concern, okay? And they're trends, right? So through – my first one is penalties. Obviously, that's apparent. Through four games, they have 44 penalties for I think it's 281 yards. That's bananas. Um, They've had, I think, four touchdowns wiped out. Uh, It's just like this is – It's bad. Like, it's sloppy football. It's a lot of pre-snap penalties that they talk about week after week, um, and they're not changing. Uh, The second thing is this run defense. Man, they cannot stop the run. They've given up 360 yards over the past – rushing yards over the past two weeks. Like, that's really bad. I mean, they're giving up a lot of passing yards, but when you you constantly preach that stopping the run is your first – uh motivation on defense man that's bad um i'm not saying that these 
opposing offenses aren't great and aren't taking an advantage of the looks they're getting, but man, um, they're giving up a lot of passing yards and a lot of rushing yards. It's not just like they're daring them to run and the pa- the opposing passing game isn't, isn't taking flight. It's just a bunch of empty rushing yards. No, this is, this is a multiplicity sort of issue. Uh, and then on the opposite side, the run offense it's like a side dish. Like, you know, when you go to like Boston market and you're like, let me get the green beans. Like that's what the running game is right now. Jeez. You know what I mean? Like the passing game is the chicken and the Mac and cheese and the stuffing and whatever else you get at Boston market. And the running game are the peas, like the green beans. Like that's what, what it is. <laughs> uh, wow. And then on wow. top of that, <laughs> sorry, I haven't been to Boston Market in a while, hungry? but I am really hungry. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but like, and then on, and then you know, fourth, fourth, last but not least, I mean, these veterans need to step up. I brought it up earlier. I just kind of look. You look at, at who this team is invested in: Fletcher Cox, Ryan Kerrigan, Eric Wilson, Anthony Harris. Rodney McLeod, Brandon Brooks, Jason Kelsey, Lane Johnson, uh, uh, Brandon Graham. Like, there's injuries, there's lack of production, there's, like, you can't control injuries, but, like, there's not a lot to show for that veteran talent through four four weeks. And I think, really, Javon Hargrave is the only well-paid gentleman who is actually pulling his weight right now. So that's quite a bit of weight, by the way. Um, and, uh, you, know, you know, real quick, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but no, you made a good point when it comes to the veterans. When you look at all these penalties that are being committed by them, it's mostly being committed by the veterans. Yeah. I can see if I can see if it was like a young guy, like, like, like say, if uh, – uh, like Smith or Milton Williams or somebody like that were jumping off sides. Okay, I understand it. They should be looking at the ball, but okay, I get it. But when you have Derek Barnett, when you have Sweat, you have these guys that are consistently creating these pre-snap penalties, that's dis- that discipline. And you think you, you'd have the discipline from the older guys to show the younger guys what to do. It. And I don't know, and I, I think I mentioned this before, but I think it's come to the point now where you have to set a tone where you start pulling people off the field now if they j- start jumping off start jumping off sides. Josh Sweat, you go off sides. Okay, you're sitting you're sitting on the bench right now for it. I know you don't like that because it means your your sack totals are gonna go down. Derek Barnett, you're gonna come in another dumb penalty. Okay, you're sitting on the bench for a while too. They have there has to be a message sent instead of just bringing it up in a powerpoint or talking about saying guys we need to fix this thing i mean i don't know if they're starting finding guys i don't know maybe that's the way to go because it's going to hurt their pockets a lot more and they think oh maybe i should just rethink about doing this stuff maybe that's the route to go but the, the eagles have to get something figure something out and do it quick yeah i agree i i mean look there's a huge talent deficiency in my opinion between the chiefs and the eagles but like when you're able to be competitive for that long in a game and then you really lose because of self-inflicted wounds and poor tackling, I mean, that's 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 a big concern. But anyway, we've talked about the concerns. Let's get into the optimism. I'm going to hand I'm going to hand the mic to you. I'm going to let you go through it. Give me a few reasons why fans should be optimistic heading into these next few games. Well, I know I've said I've come down really hard tonight, but looking at this this team could really be three and one, and there really are a lot of bright spots that I see on this team when you look at it. I look at the fact that, hey, you know what? Remember, we were talking about, hey, why, where are the tight ends going? Why haven't they been used more? Well, lo and behold, look at this. You see Goddard and Ertz being used a lot today, and I think they're going to continue to do that, and Hertz is starting to build a lot of chemistry with that. Look at Kenny Gainwell. Even though Miles Sanders is, start, is getting a lack of touches, you'll have Kenny Gainwell starting to emerge himself on third downs and two minute offense. He's starting to make a lot of a big impact. It's, he's become one of these players where whenever he has a ball, it, it's it's exciting to watch because you don't know what he's going to do with it. And that's what I see out of Kenny Gainwell. I think this offensive line depth has been tested early on with all these injuries, but they're holding their own. I saw the Chiefs run a stunt. Steve Spagnuolo ordered a stunt in the fourth quarter, and you're seeing it, it, was, it was a complex stunt. You had the, the end going around toward where the nose was, the nose, the defensive tackle was going back around the other end, and they'd throw our linebacker on the inside middle. Herbig and Driscoll and Kelsey, even though he's the old guy of the group, well, well, old for 30 so because I'm older than him, but that makes it worse. But you see the young guys be, hold, pick up that stunt, and they held their own, and he did a good job. So I think that's another thing. You got to credit Jeff Stoutland for getting them ready, but these young guys have the potential to do a lot of good things. And 
you look at these things and you see it and you see this could potentially they, they can turn things around. Like I said earlier, they could easily be three and one and it could have been three and one heading to Carolina, Carolina and everybody's like the city is going crazy now calling Nick Sirianni possibly the next Andy Reid, blah, 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 and all that stuff. But now they're one in three. It, they, it's all because of self-inflicted stuff. And if they really truly do get things cleaned up, if the captains enforce this and make sure that they don't commit as many penalties, as they make sure that they're focused and disciplined, if they fix these things up, they can salvage this season. Not, I think I had them going with seven wins coming in this year. I still think they get seven wins, but it's going to be one of those things where they can build upon it and actually look like a team that could be dangerous in 2022, 2023, if they continue to get better as this season goes along. And I think that all starts with Jalen Hurts, and I'm really excited about what he's doing. Yeah, I I mean, look, I think there's a lot of positives to take away from what Jalen did today. I, I, But again, you know, you look at this and – uh, you know, <laughs> look, they're going to play the, the the Carolina Panthers who had their first loss of the season against Dallas. Uh, I think that's a winnable game. Um, I think they win that game. Yeah, I'm I do too. Right now, I, I do too. I th- I'm going to say it right now too. I do. Like, it's a must win in my opinion. Um, but do you think? Do you think there's must given that the season that they're currently have to go right now with, given that with all the young guys and everything else, do you feel like they have must win games now? And not from a, a standing standpoint, but from a morale and and like uh, locker room sensibility sort of uh, standpoint. So like, if they lose four straight games, this is a young locker room. It's very easily could turn on its head, right? Uh, if they can get this win, you know, you're looking at a situation where okay, you learn from your mistakes. You had a uh, uh, a solid performance against a really solid defense an okay offense in a winnable game. You want a game that you could win. And I think that's how you kind of build momentum in this league, especially when you're a young team, like winning the games that you're supposed to win. Right. Like, I don't think anybody thought that they were going to beat the chiefs. I, none of us picked Dallas. I mean, or, or sorry, uh, for the past few weeks, uh, all of the NJ.com writers have picked the Cowboys and the Chiefs. Nobody really expected them to beat either one of those teams. San Francisco, we were kind of split on. I thought they should beat San Francisco. But the last two games, they got beat by better teams. Like, significantly better teams, in my opinion. Um, Carolina's not a significantly better team. They've had a relatively easy month to start off with. I think the Eagles can beat them. Um And that's kind of where my head's at. If they can beat them, then they can take that momentum into facing Tampa, who I don't think they will beat. Again, another team that I don't think they can beat. But if they if they play them competitively, that that builds some momentum, they could potentially beat the Raiders. We'll see. Um, And then they set head into a second half where I think the Broncos are a bit of a paper tiger. Uh, The lines are horrible. Um, Most of the division's bad. So, look, I, I, do I think the Eagles are going to make a push for the playoffs? No, but I do think they can have some building ground over the next two months if they're able to kind of step up, like put all this this month in the past and kind of take a, a leap forward against Carolina. That's where my head's at. So for your closing thoughts, Chris, tell me what your biggest takeaway from this game was. Positive, negative, for the future, for the past. Uh, give me something that's tangible. My biggest takeaway is I'm con- really concerned about the red zone offense. I still am concerned about the red zone play calling, especially when it comes to the end of the first half, because we saw what happened against the end of the 49, the, four, the end of the first half of the 49ers game when it came to that Philly special play and what happened with that at that, that debacle. And then going into the chief with the Chiefs, they had a first and goal, I believe, from the three yard line, and they they had to settle for a field goal. And you continually cannot settle for field goals and not get touchdowns and expect to do better and win and for your offense to evolve. So I really want to see how Sirianni gets better as an offensive play caller in the red zone because and I and I think it personally is part of the personnel. I think you look at this, 
that these receivers aren't the tallest and not any quarterbacks are the tallest. I know you have Ertz and Goddard. They're a little bit bigger as well, too. But we know what our single white side is now. You can't really truly rely on them. And then you have guys that are around 6'1", 6'2", or, or less. And it's tough to see that when you have all the, that compact space with all those bodies around there in that short space trying to get open in there. Just, the windows are tighter. So I want to see Sirianni try to rely more on the run inside there. At least try. And not, and I don't mean a run from the shotgun or, or RPO. Thing. I want an actual design run. I don't care if you put Jack Stoll or Dallas Goddard, or if you bring in an additional lineman to be an additional blocker, try to pound the ball in from three yard from three yards out, and then try to build your offense and try to score that way. Because two games at home, two games at home now, and you get and you fail to score that, giving the other team momentum. So they have to. I just want to see how Sirianni continues to correct his red zone play calling. How about you? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, an overwhelming uh, <laughs> issue for this team. Um, it, I, again, I go back to the veterans pulling their weight. This was supposed to be uh, a group that was supposed to assist Sirianni in building a, a culture and a program. And we heard about how all the veterans were stoked about the way they were being coached and everything. You know, this could be the final year in Philadelphia for a lot of notable players. And it just kind of seems like – they haven't stepped up when they've been needed the most like veteran players need to anchor this thing. And right now, Jason Kelsey and Javon Hargrave are really the only two guys that have consistently brought the goods. Um, So in order for the Eagles to really turn this thing around, beat Carolina and and kind of move in the right direction, the veterans are really going to need to step up uh, and, and really make the most of their, perhaps their final campaign in Philadelphia. Guys, you can sign up for Eagles Extra at nj.com slash text. Chris and I have a lot of fun on there with you guys. We like to send uh, commentary throughout games and throughout the week. You can beat the madness that is social media and focus heavily on your phone uh, without having to deal with like all the negative stuff on Twitter and Facebook, etc., kind of weed through it. Uh, you can also give us five star reviews and, and subscribe to the No Huddle Show podcast wherever podcasts are available. Uh, for Chris, I'm Mike. We will see you very, very soon. Well, I guess we won't see you. We're recording this, so uh, you'll, <laughs> you'll hear us from us soon. I promise. Uh, talk to you guys later. Bye. You have the determination to make things happen, the will to lead, and the skills to start, run, and grow your own business. Bank of America believes that's only the beginning of what you can accomplish. As part of its ongoing commitment to women small business owners, local specialists will work one-on-one with you to meet the needs of your business. You get the advice, guidance, and resources that can help you navigate challenges today and prepare for what's ahead. To learn more about how you can grow your business with confidence, visit bankofamerica.com slash sbwomen. Bank of America. What would you like? like the power to do.